Welcome everybody to Wednesday live stream, where I try to pick a topic that will be very impactful for you regarding nutrition. I try to pick things that I think you can take right out of here after tonight and implement them into your life. And they all, in some way, obviously come back to how to balance your diet. Because my whole take on it is you're eating one way, the best way, to get the most impact out of how you eat, right? So my whole premise is that it's about maintaining your leanest weight based on understanding how important it is to balance the macronutrients, protein, fiber, carbs, and fats, certain percentage to basically have four main areas impactful in, for you that will do the best optimum health, which is muscles, insulin, gut bacteria, brain chemicals. So tonight, what I want to dive into is cardiovascular disease because it is the number one killer and it's 100% preventable. A lot of people don't realize that diabetes and cardiovascular disease is really about maintaining the right diet. Don't know why they're not talking more about it, but I'm going to bring it to you tonight. So what I want to get right into is talk about how food um, causes heart attacks. Well, not really, but not knowing how to eat food can actually be part of heart attacks, can be the, heart, the whole cardiovascular disease scope. So let's get into it. First of all, um, let me make sure everybody can see my screen. Okay, there we go. So what I hope you get out of this is what diet does to induce cardiovascular risk and how to prevent it, and the pathology behind heart disease. So I think if you understand the uh, root cause of everything, then it makes a whole lot of sense when you're trying to prevent it through diet. So I don't like to just say, oh, do this, don't do that, because like, really, if you don't understand why you're doing something, then I'm not sure it really makes a lot of sense, because then you're just trying to remember what to do or what not to do. So what I want to first talk about is what is the main culprit behind heart disease? And the main culprit behind heart disease are uh, radicals, free radicals, are these compounds that the body naturally makes. So when you think of a fire and you think of the fire releasing smoke, the smoke is the end product of this fire. Well, you are a little mini fire because you have a metabolism, keeps your temperature 97 degrees. So in all reality, you are a mini little furnace. So this little furnace of yours, as it releases oxygen and creates what's called ATP, the energy that you run on, it basically releases a byproduct just like smoke is to a fire that are called free radicals. So these are electrons that have one um, sticky part to it. So chemically, the sticky part sticks to other tissues in the body and can actually cause damage. So these free radicals are involved in a chemical process called oxidation. And when these free radicals get way in excess in the body, they create what's called oxidative stress. Now, oxidation is a normal chemical process, not harmful, but in regards to free radicals, when they get in excess, then this type of chemical reaction can be harmful. So these are the main players and this is really the start of cardiovascular disease, something that your body already makes um, that I guess in some ways we say kind of gets a little out of hand. So we want to know how to get it back in a neutral position. Diet helps do that. So let's talk about these free radicals. When an overload of free radicals cannot gradually be destroyed, so the body has a way to destroy them, to neutralize them. Their accumulation in the body generates oxidative stress. And it goes on to say this oxidative stress is really responsible for a lot of chronic degenerative illnesses, cancer, dementia, aging, cataracts, arthritis, cardiovascular disease, pretty much you can name it, a, a free radical oxidation is probably involved to some extent. So it's something in the body that we definitely want to know how to neutralize. The human body has several mechanisms to counteract this oxidative stress by producing antioxidants. So free radicals are oxidizers. So we want to get a order called 
antioxidizers, which are called antioxidants, which are either some are produced by the body and some we can take through supplementation. So I think everybody's here heard of an antioxidant because that's kind of a pretty common word in nutrition. So what an antioxidant is, it's a neutralizer of a free radical. So that may be a new concept for some of you guys, because I'm sure you've heard of antioxidants. You just knew they were good for you, but you really weren't sure what exactly they did. So we're going to talk about that tonight. So when we talk about the role of free radicals in the toxicity and disease this talks about the oxidative stress in the highlighted area associated with the production of oxygen species, which are these free radicals that are involved not only in toxicity, also in the pathology of aging, um, age-related diseases, cataracts, like I said, neurological disorders. And these free radicals, these oxygen species, have biological targets, these free radicals. And this is what has been clinically associated with tissue damage. So this is where a lot of this takes place, causes this disease state because it actually affects the tissue. So how do we get these things neutralized? We do it by something called glutathione. So glutathione is a chemical that the liver makes and all our cells make. Glutathione is a chemical that is actually made that goes and neutralizes these free radicals. So here you are, a little human, metabolizing, being this little furnace that you are. And as you're metabolizing, you're releasing all these free radicals into your system. It's a very normal process, just like smoke is to a fire. Well, that's okay, because the body produces something called glutathione that goes and neutralizes all those free radicals so that they can't stick on to tissue and tear it apart. So they actually latch onto that free radical and they inactivate it. And then of course the body flushes them out. So an important part of this glutathione is understanding there's actually a recipe. And I have a great video if you go to my YouTube channel, Myrna Method YouTube, and it's called Glutathione and the MTHFR gene. And I have a great video that talks about how important certain vitamins are to create glutathione. So glutathione doesn't really just, I mean, it happens on its own, but you can really not make as much of it as you should. You could be impaired and how much you produce because you're not eating correctly. So these free radicals are going to be very important culprit to cardiovascular disease. So these free radicals are the number one agent. They tear up our arteries in a certain way, which we're going to get to in a minute. But we want to figure out how to neutralize these. And the way we neutralize these is that we use some vitamins and minerals. Some of the basic ones are your B vitamins and zinc and magnesium and choline. Some of these things that are naturally found in foods. But if you're not eating a diet that has these, you may not get enough of them. When you don't have a certain gene, a certain enzyme, and some people can have a gene that has a mutation and they don't make this enzyme. This enzyme called the MTHFR enzyme actually helps take B9 folate and make it into a chemical the cell can accept. So there's certain people, 20% of the population that have a mutation on the gene and they don't do this as well which means they're not going to be very good at making glutathione. There are going to be more at risk for cancers and cardiovascular disease because they didn't have this enzyme. So this enzyme, and like I said, I have a whole video on it if you really want to get into it. So what happens is when you miss this enzyme, you make something called homocysteine. And we can test for homocysteine in the blood, and that really tells us when you have homocysteine, you're going to be more um, predisposed for cardiovascular disease. You're going to be at greater risk for cardiovascular disease and cancers and autoimmune diseases because you lack an enzyme that allows you to make glutathione that neutralizes those free radicals because it's the free radicals when they get out of control, when you're making way too much of them, more than you're, you're making more than you neutralize 
they cause damage in cells. So homocysteine is a protein in the blood we can measure. And when we see that, we know, ooh, we better do something. So here's what we do. We make sure that you get a methylated vitamin because the reason why you can't take vitamin B9 folate and change it into something the cell can take is that you are unable to methylate it. But if you buy vitamins that have methylated Bs, then you're fine. You actually can run through this chemical process. But at the end of the day, what happens is the body takes all these nutrients and then it creates something called glutathione. And glutathione is the master antioxidant in the body. So the cells have a capacity to make this. The other thing the cells so that's one thing. And the other way you can get antioxidants is to actually take in certain vitamins and minerals. For instance, vitamin A, which is from the beta carotenes, that's the orange and the reds and the yellows that you see in vegetables. Those are rich sources of a certain type of vitamin A called beta carotene. That is a beautiful antioxidant. And also a lot of um, vitamin C is another antioxidant and vitamin E. So these are vitamins that actually do the same thing as glutathione does, is they stick onto those free radicals and help neutralize them. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what these free radicals do when they're in circulation. So this slide is a great, this slide is going to tell you the whole story. This is probably the most important slide we have tonight. Tells the story in one quick picture. So what happens is these free radicals, one of their most favorite things they love to oxidize is fats, particularly LDL cholesterols. So when you get your blood work, you're going to see cholesterol, and then you're going to see HDL, which is typically the good cholesterol. Then you're going to see, see something called LDL, which are considered the not so good cholesterol. And why are the LDL not so good cholesterol? Because it's these cholesterols that in combination with free radicals, cause the hot mess we get into with cardiovascular disease. What happens is these free radicals absolutely love to oxidize LDL fats. So if you look at your lipid panel, if you look at your blood panel and you see a lot of these fats, then what you're going to find is that you're going to be at a greater risk for heart disease because these free radicals act upon these fats. And what happens is it releases an inflammatory response. Because remember, when anything gets damaged in the body, you're going to have inflammation. So the fact that these free radicals are damaging some fats in the artery wall. So these fats are going from the artery wall, they're trying to get to the lumen, so they have to go to the wall to get to the lumen. That's where all the blood rushes in and out. And the, as they're going through this wall, they get stuck between the wall before they can get this being the lumen where all the blood's traveling. So when this LDL is being oxidized by these free radicals, because that's where these free radicals are, they're all inside that wall, triggers inflammation, which then triggers an immune cell. And that immune cell is called a macrophage. And these immune cells come to the site and their main job is to just to hose the area down. They actually put a foam cell over this oxidation process. They're actually trying to stop all this from happening. So these immune cells actually put down a foam cell, and that foam cell is what is called plaque. So that, that foam cell then is plaque, and that plaque can then calcify and it gets nice and hard. So as that plaque calcifies and it becomes hard, then there's less damage that it's going to break off because it's really stuck on that wall. So that's kind of less dangerous because soft plaque is what can break from that wall and cause a heart attack. The hard plaque, what it does, which is not so good either, is it narrows the artery wall. So what happens with cardiovascular disease, a couple things. We have the free radicals acting on the LDL fats, which then trigger inflammation, which then triggers an immune cell, which then lays down a foam cell. And over time, that foam cell begins to harden and form a calcified plaque. 
And there's two tests I'm going to tell you about to find out how much calcified plaque you have and how much soft plaque, because both matter. The calcified plaque is hard, less dangerous. The soft plaque, not so good because it can dislodge or break through the wall. So what's one risk factor we have of that wall weakening is the bacteria in your gut. There's certain bacteria that can get inside that wall and can actually cause lesions, can actually cause a weakening of that artery wall. And why is that a bad thing? Because if that artery wall is weak and you have soft plaque building up, it can burst out of that opening. And it's when that plaque bursts from that wall that it can dislodge and it can cause what's a heart attack. Because when it gets stuck in that artery and we can't get blood flow into the heart, that is going to be the problem. So this is what heart disease is. It's a function of free radicals acting upon LDL fats, and also at the same time, bacteria that's coming from the gut, particularly a bacteria I talk a lot is TMAO. And this bacteria is from eating a lot of fatty animals, cheese and butter and meats. So your gut bacteria comes from the food you eat. So you actually build the landscape in your gut based on the foods you're consuming. And that is absolutely huge because whatever bacteria you have in your gut is going to travel. And the bad ones in this case can actually weaken the artery wall. We've also found a lot of these same bacteria in the plaque in the teeth. So periodontal disease, another big problem because these bacteria also travel and can go to the same locale. Now, if you have a great diet and you're cleaning up your gut, What's amazing is your periodontal disease will also clean up. So it all comes back to gut bacteria, right? And these gut bacteria can actually be an independent marker for cardiovascular disease, independent of the LDL because of the fact it does weaken the artery wall. So that is heart disease, folks. That's how it, do- that's how it works. It's that simple. It's these free radicals that act upon these LDL fats that cause this foam cell that then can harden and narrow the artery wall or can continue to build up and become soft plaque. And then eventually the soft plaque will harden. And this is the danger because we worry about that artery wall getting weak because our gut bacteria isn't so good because our diet's not so great. And this can cause a breakage, a rupture, which would be the heart attack. So what we see happening is when this artery wall becomes narrow, then that's when people go in for stents. So they go in there, they put in a little stent, and they try to open up that area to help the blood flow through. So let's talk about some of the things that can happen through this calcification. Because the calcification that happens in these arteries can also happen valves, And the calcification is a very degenerative process, okay? And it says in this study that it's from lipid accumulation and inflammation and calcification. Now, a lot of times in studies, they don't give you the full pathology of anything. They just say, hey, a lot of lipid, a lot of fat accumulation can cause inflammation. But I just told you the story and I told you how it all happens, And some of these studies, when you read them, sometimes they'll just give you little bits and pieces. But if you don't have the full story, you can't really figure out the picture and how it works. Also, the two tests that are really important is either a calcium score. So a calcium score is just going to tell you how much of that plaque is hardened over time. And the soft plaque is the one we really worry most about. Hard plaque's not great, okay? But at least if you do have some type of lesion in your artery wall and it's maybe weakened, but you have hard plaque, eh, it's risk of nothing's going to rupture. It's pretty stable. So we call that stable plaque. And we call the soft plaque unstable. But let me tell you something. If you have calcified plaque, you're growing also the soft plaque. Because a lot of times people will go get a calcium score. By the way, you should have a calcium score of zero. That's what you should have. So they might have a calcium score of 90. Anything over 100, they consider starting to to kind of worry. And anything over 300, not good. 
So you're getting up there with this calcium score. Just keep in mind, the more soft plaque you're building on top of the hard plaque, that calcifies. So over time, you sort of build these layers of plaque that just keeps calcifying. So whenever I see somebody with a calcium score over zero, I'm like, okay, you're starting the process. Your soft plaque is becoming hard plaque. And what's really a little concerning in medicine is they wait until you get something before they tell you how to prevent it. So a lot of times they don't even worry with the calcium score until someone's getting up around 150 or close to 200. But that is craziness because why not get them to prevent it right away? Why not start reversing it? Why are we waiting this to get anything over zero? The other thing we want to look at is the soft plaque. So the calcium score, by the way, your doctor can, I think most insurances will pay for that. You're, you go into like this little um, cylinder and you go in there and you come back out and they do a whole scan of your body. And that's how they see the calcification in the vascular system. You can also do a CIMT and they take the carotid artery, they take an image of it. And they're able to see the thickness of the wall. So the CIMT is used for the soft plaque. And that's a much better, that's probably the best test out there going right now. Okay. So that's the one that, you know, patients that have a calcium score, I always like to get them to also get a CIMT score. Can't hurt but you might as well have seen what you might as well see what the soft plaque's doing because we already know you got hard plaque and you're in the process of building. Okay, so what's the cause of all this? What is the ticket? And it comes down to excess fatty acids. And it's going to go back to that whole science I talk about with ceramides. Now, I know a lot of doctors aren't talking about ceramides because a lot of times they can be 20 or 25 years behind some of the research. But we're going to talk about it here and how it's implicated with these excess fatty acids. So excess fatty acids comes from too much. And the word is too much, too much body fat and too much dietary fat. So you can be lean as a beanpole and just be eating a diet really high in fat and you're going to be in trouble. Why is that? Because the body wants you to maintain dietary balance. So all this hogwash about these diets where they're saying, oh, we want 60% fats and I think we'll tell somebody to have this many proteins. It's already been decided based on biochemistry. So whatever people are telling you out there, it's like, well, where are you getting that information? Are you just thinking it's just what's better for weight loss, which is usually the case. But we got to look at what's better for the science and the science of your body, how it works, how to reverse disease and yeah, get down to your leanest weight. So excess fatty acids, this is trying to decide how, how do we figure out how much is too fat, how much fat is too much. So ideally, it's anywhere from 20% to 30% of your diet. Possibly, I might be okay with 35%. But remember, I deal with a lot of patients, a lot of clinical issues, and I find it's usually 25 to 30 is where I'm putting most people because they already have some stents or they have some cardiovascular disease. They might have some genetic markers. Typically, what that means in grams, and I took calories here because the average calories for most people are going to be 1,500. That's if you're a small person like me or a larger person, it's going to be anywhere from 2,000 to maybe 2,200 calories. Now, that's not taking into effect that you're active. Now, if you're active, so say you're working on a farm or you're exercising, well, those calories are going to come mostly from carbs. You're not going to need fat to back up those calories because remember, when you're active, muscles want carbs, okay? So when I do the numbers here, I'm showing that if you're doing like an hour of exercise, it can be anywhere from 250 to 500 extra calories. And that's going to hopefully come mostly from your carbs. That's what the muscles need. So if we look at just your daily average, and I just do the numbers on that, 25% is going to be anywhere from 40 grams to 60 grams. 30% is going to be anywhere from 50 to 75 grams. So on an average, what I tell most people, eh, if we're hitting 50 to 60, we're probably going to be okay. 50 to 60 grams is the ballpark I use for most people. Now, if you're using my app, 
as you know, your smaller person or her bigger person, it's going to give you a number obviously more conducive to the size you are. But if I had to give a ballpark figure, I'm going to say 50 to 60 because I know it might be like 35% or maybe 25 I know I'm going to be hitting the range pretty close. So the key is knowing what your fat grams are. Because when you look at one single meal, and a lot of these restaurants actually have their macronutrient amounts and they'll tell you what's in there, you will be shocked to see that one meal could be easily 60 to 70 grams. One tablespoon of olive oil is 15 grams. One small serving of nuts is 15 grams. You could, one avocado is 22 grams. One avocado, a tablespoon of oil and some nuts for the day, and you could easily be up around 40 to 50 grams right there. Okay, so the key is understanding that there's a macronutrient balance when you eat, period. Okay, so I mean, if you get if you're at 80 grams, okay, I'm going to I don't really see, you know, somebody's 60, 70, 80 grams fluctuating. It's when they're up around 100 to 120 grams that I start seeing those labs change. And I talked about it last night. I had a patient. He's like, I don't know, I'm doing this, this whole balance thing. And I'm looking at the person's diet and I'm realizing they're about 40 to 50 grams over what they need to be. And they're like, oh man, I just, just ate a little more, I ate one more avocado. I was eating two avocados a day. Our avocados are healthy, right? Yeah, but look at it, it's affecting your insulin resistance. That's where I, sh- I saw it immediately with this person. So it does make a difference. The body wants you to keep your macronutrients a certain way. So I wanted to just give that amount because I think it's important when I'm talking about this for you to be able to come right back and know what that means as far as you and your food. So let's talk about lipid toxicity. It increases ceramides. And this is really important to understand this because when excess fatty acids begin to accumulate in non-fat tissue... So non-fat tissue are usually things like the liver, muscles, anything and everything in the body that it's not a fat cell. So fat cells are designed to store fat. Muscle cells really are not. I mean, muscles will have some fat in them. That's totally normal. But when muscles start to get an excess of fats, so when muscles start to get an excess of fats, because maybe you're eating too much dietary fat, maybe you're just too fat, right? Maybe you're 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight, your body is going to be releasing fatty acids into circulation. Just kind of what fat does. So you could be eating just more calories than you should. Maybe you're not even eating a high-fat diet, but you're not balancing your diet, so you're overeating. That can create excess fatty acids. Remember, it's excess body fat, excess dietary fat. So these fatty acids begin to accumulate in this muscle cell, and they change to a different type of fat. And that fat is called a ceramide. And these ceramide fats are very disruptive to cellular membranes. In fact, it's the ceramide fats that go and really gunk up the insulin receptor sites. They go in there, just gunk up these receptor sites that hormones latch onto to get things done. So when you have a cell, cells have all these little receptor sites and these little receptor sites are just waiting for that special hormone or that special peptide to latch on and do great special things for the cell. So these receptor sites are what can be affected by ceramides because if the ceramides go in there and gunk up that receptor site, whenever that special little peptide or that special little hormone goes to latch on to do its magic, it can't because the receptor sites all gunked up, which is what insulin resistance is. Insulin resistance is when the receptor site for insulin is all gunked up with ceramides. Okay, so that's what happens with diabetes. It's about excess fatty acids. It's about this lipid toxicity. And why do I say that? Because that is directly tied into LDL fats, okay? You start increasing this lipid toxicity, you're going to see it reflected in your lipid panel. It's just the way it is. So that means that we're going to start that cycle. Excess LDLs. We're going to have free radicals acting upon them, the inflammation. We're going to have the bacteria in the gut. Maybe we're not eating so great. 
So this is what's going on. This is preventable because everything here has to do with what you're putting in your mouth. So we'll talk about the emerging roles of ceramides in this study, cardiovascular disease. It talks about the regulation, if you look in the highlight, of ceramide levels under pathological conditions, including heart attacks, hypertension, clogging of the arteries, that's what that arthrosclerosis is, has drawn great attention. Increased ceramide levels are strongly associated with adverse cardiovascular risk and events, that means heart attacks, while inhibiting a synthesis of ceramides. This is really about ceramides accelerating the cardiovascular disease risk. And where are these ceramides coming from? Well, in the next study, it talks about ceramides. It's a key lipotoxic player, lipo meaning fat, key fat toxic player. And the key with the ceramides in this study, let me just blow it up so you guys can see it a little better, talks about obesity fuel disorders, which is going to be diabetes and cardiovascular disease. But it's talking about that being from an accumulation of harmful lipid metabolites. And what they're referring to there is these metabolites that get into tissue that's not suited for lipid storage. Tissue metabolites that goes into tissue that's not suited for fat storage, like liver, heart, pancreatic cells, and also muscle cells. Among the numerous lipid subtypes that do this, that accumulate, it is the ceramides that are the ones we're most concerned about. And these are the ones that cause insulin resistant, ins- insulin resistant and dyslipidemia. And what that means is excess lipids excess fats in your blood. And we typically see that dyslipidemia involved with your lipid panel. So when your doctor says you have that, he's looking at those LDL cholesterols and that's where he's saying, oh, you got high lipids. You have high fat. You can be thin and still have elevated LDL. So if you're thin and you have LDL, elevated LDL, you may be burning your calories because you're out there working out but you're eating not balanced. Either you're eating foods where it's just you're, you're too many fats, you're eating 40% fats, and as little as 40% fat, what I have seen on labs can make a difference. So 10% more, you can, instead of being at 80 grams of fat, I've seen patients up around 120, 100 grams of fat, which isn't hard to do, and there, it's actually affecting the lipid panel. And what happens with that is that then starts that whole cycle of free radicals. So when you're young, okay, it takes a while to build up. So you're in your 30s and 40s and your lipid panel may not have time to have some of this damage. But definitely when you start getting in your 50s and 60s, especially if you're obese, it'll happen much quicker. This is where we're going to really start to see the difference in our cholesterols, right? And that's why I always say, as you get older, guys, your margin is smaller, right? You don't have wiggle room, especially if you start having some of these numbers. So let's talk about some things that can really reverse this, particularly the calcified plaque. Is there any way that we can start eating away at the hard stuff? Because nobody wants to have their arteries narrowed. So to get to the soft plaque, we just have to balance, right? We have to balance our diet. We have to reduce the fats down to a 30% level. We have to eat more fibers. And I'm going to explain to you why that's important is because of a particular vitamin called vitamin K1. Now, vitamin K1 is involved in clotting. It helps build bone. It's in all green plants. And I'm going to show you how much vitamin K1 is in green plants so that you have an idea of knowing how many green plants do I need to eat to affect the calcification, to eat away at that calcification in my arteries. So this K1 that comes from green plants, and I'll show you other foods that have K1, it converts to K2 in the gut. It's actually the bacteria in the gut that helps convert that. Here we go again, folks. We're getting right back into the gut bacteria, how important it is 
to have that gut bacteria healthy, right? Really important. So this K2, which is MK7, it actually activates a matrix GL protein, we'll call MGP. And it is this protein that is coming from K2 that came from the K1 that was acted upon from gut bacteria that is huge, instrumental in stopping this calcification in the soft tissue. So it is actually this MGP protein that is so sought out after. And there's a lot of supplements. We'll have the K2, but I'm going to show you how much is in food. And there's way better magic to get it in food. Why? Because there's all these other chemicals in the food that are better in your gut, right? Because there's definitely a gut implication here. So just taking loads of supplements of K2, um, we don't know what's in that supplement. And it's a gut thing as well. So eating it from the food, you're going to get a greater advantage, okay? Because it's a food thing. It comes with fermentation. Now, I'm not saying that taking K2 won't help because there's studies that show it can from the supplement. So let's talk about this. We got a study. And it talks about can vitamin K reverse calcification in arteries. And this study talks about that um, adequate intake of K2 has been shown to lower vascular damage because it activates the MGP, which inhibits calcium from depositing in the vessel walls. However, vitamin K2 deficiency results in the inactivation of MGP. So if your gut is all screwed up, chances are you're probably not going to do this as well. Because we talked about when you have gut dysbiosis, because you're not eating a balanced diet, this affects your health in many ways. This particularly is one example. If you look at the yellow highlight at the bottom, it talks about how the um, in this study that they did on over 4,000 men and women, that they found that the vitamin K2 actually did help in reversal. And it helped with this artery calcification. So let's talk about some of how the conversion rate. So how much K1 converts to K2? And and I'll show you a study, in, in a lot of studies I've looked at, approximately there's a 10 to 20% conversion rate. And I think a lot of that 20, 10 to 20% conversion rate is probably due to some individual variability of different people's guts, right? So if you have a really healthy gut, it's probably higher on the 20%. Uh, not so healthy, it could be lower on the 10% or maybe even lower. But the key here is in most studies, this MK7, this K2, if we can get 32 micrograms, studies show that's a number that we're really seeing change, right? That number is kicking some butt out there. So I'm going, all right, well, that's the number they're seeing the change in studies, and I'm going to show you the studies next. Then... Let's go look at food and vitamin K and do the conversion. Let's see how much K2 we're actually getting from food. So here's the chart. And uh, NATO is um, from soybeans that it's tofu that's been fermented. And that's really high. That's like the highest. That's 850 K1 micrograms. But if you look at collard greens, boiled a half a cup, I mean, half a cup, right? That's not a whole lot. That's 530. If you look at turnip greens, half a cup cooked, 426. Spinach, 145. Kale, one cup, raw, 113. Broccoli, half a cup, cooked, 110. So you can see that there's these green vegetables are loaded in vitamin K1. And if we do the conversion rate, if we look at 300 micrograms, and many of these are well over 300, I mean, you could eat easily two cups of kale, be pretty close to that. If you look at 300 micrograms and you do the math, right? If you look at 10% of 300, you're going to be at 30. And we know if it, it, you could probably be 200 if you're getting a 20% conversion and well be into the 32 micrograms of the K2. 
that is known to create the protein that helps get rid of this calcification. So that to me is amazing because it tells me food is pretty huge. And this study talks about proper calcium use, vitamin K. Um, This one was uh, about bone health because the vitamin K is also instrumental with bone health. But I thought I would show you in this study, they did talk about um, the MGP and how it actually is helps with reversing the artery calcification. And here it talks about, in this study, at least 32 micrograms of vitamin K2 is when it's present in the diet, then this actually has been shown to reverse the blood vessel calcification and considerably helps with heart disease, okay? So that's where we're getting some of these numbers. I think numbers are great. I live by numbers, right, as a dietitian, because we can talk about eat healthy, eat this Mediterranean diet, but okay, what does that mean? Unless we're looking at the numbers, it isn't real because numbers matter. Numbers matter in your life and your bank account and numbers matter in your diet. So in this case, we're seeing that if you did two cups of greens, you are covered. You are what you do a cup of greens. You could be covered pretty much. So this really brings home the fact greens are super important, right? And 32 micrograms can be done with easily one to two cups of greens a day. And the fermentation happens in your gut. That's part of the process with these greens. The body does it naturally, okay? So it's not like you got to take special probiotics for it. Not that probiotics don't help, but it's the body does this fermentation with this vitamin K naturally. We all have that naturally, no problem, okay? So that to me is awesome information because that really backs up more how important it is to eat the right diet. And this study talks about how vitamin K, just more research that is found primarily in the leafy green vegetables and that it's synthesized through intestinal bacteria to get down to the vitamin K2. So anyways, that to me is super interesting because it says that, look, Cardiovascular disease is really a dietary disease, just like diabetes. The number one killers in our country, we can prevent, period. And it happens immediately. You start changing your diet and all of a sudden it starts to reverse itself. That's how crazy this is, okay? Now, if you're 50 or 60 years old, you got a lot of hard plaque, okay, you're gonna have to maybe be a little more diligent, but it still starts to reverse itself. So in summary... We want to eat two cups of greens, at least one and a half to two cups of greens. Um, Vitamin D is also instrumental. I didn't have a lot of time to really go into vitamin D, but some of the research on vitamin D, not only with bone health, but also with your immune system, also works with vitamin K. So vitamin D is important. And by the way, we're probably all deficient in it. You should have your doctor give you a vitamin D test, period. Everybody should have it. Every time you get your blood work, you should get a vitamin D test. And you want to have that vitamin D definitely between 50 and 70, okay, in, in your blood test. A lot of times they're saying, oh, if you're as long as you're over 30, well, the studies I'm seeing, you want it a little higher than that. And we want to do a balanced diet. That's what the Myrna Method's all about, is teaching you how to eat and understand what a balanced diet is. And of course, it comes right back to the numbers. It comes back to the numbers. Now, I know there's a lot out there with all these different supplements, and I'm not going to down them. I mean, I, I'm not, hey, they can't hurt you. Maybe they can help you. But at the end of the day, it's not those supplements that are going to make a difference. It's the food. The biggest impact you're going to make is in these macronutrients understanding how the diet part works. And then, of course, I put 50 to 60 grams of fat. Much that's going to cover everybody. It might be a little lower for some people, maybe up around the 30 to 35 for other people. But I think you're going to be out of the danger zone right there. It's going to be pretty pretty good right there. Fiber, 35 grams. Why fiber? I use fiber to balance your diet because I know it can control insulin. But this is a perfect example how bringing in the fibers in the diet can make a difference in keeping your gut healthy. Because if the gut bacteria gets whacked out, that bacteria can affect enzymes. 
It can make things like this, converting that vitamin K, not work as well. That's what bad gut bacteria does. Asymptomatic. You don't know what's going on. You don't know that you're having all these health issues and your body's improvising because you don't feel it. Okay. So that's a big thing about prevention is you, you're doing things because you know it can make a difference. But also, where are you going to see the difference? Is your CIMT score, it's going to come down. So when you start doing the things that I'm saying that are needed to do, it's not like you're just blindly doing all this. It changes your labs, okay? That's why I'm an RD and I got patients coming to me because I'm changing lab values. So this is where you're going to see it is in that CIMT score. And I've actually seen the calcium scores come down as well over a period of a year. And they always say, oh, your calcium score can't change. Not true. Seen a change. So the key is we're eating our greens. We're doing the vitamin D. We're eating the balanced diet, keeping our fat grams where they should be, and then keeping our fiber grams where they should be, maintaining that fiber with plant sources, Leafy greens being one of them, and then maintaining your ideal body weight. That's huge. Because if your ideal body weight is where it should be, then we know you can have less excess fatty acids in circulation because you're going to be at your ideal body weight. So I hope this was helpful. Um, it all comes back to balance, right? It all comes back to understanding how to eat to maintain your leanest and healthiest self. So you can always contact me. Um, you can go to my website. Uh, you guys can also, a lot of you guys get me through email, any questions, or if there's any live stream that you want me to go over, I'd love to do that. Just give me a topic and I will definitely run with it. So I've got some things on the chat. Um, yeah, can you touch on the relationship of heart disease and meat? Not sure if you talked about it tonight. I see many men choosing paleo and carnivore diets because they saw they because they think it's the best, but I'm not sure it is the best diet choice in relation to heart health. Am I mistaken? Perhaps the age of the person affects how good the diet is. Your thoughts? Well, I'm going to tell you that when you look at meat, the problem with meat is it has a lot of saturated fat, okay? So that's one ticket there. And the saturated fat is one of the most promoting of the LDL, okay? So if we had a whole ball of fat, and this whole ball of fat was coming from a saturated fat, from an animal fat, it's gonna create more LDL than if that whole ball of fat was coming from nuts or avocados. And this is where a lot of the people say, oh, well, then it's okay to do nuts or avocados. But even at a certain amount of those, you might be able to get away with a little more, but it can also cause too much fat, it's just too much fat in the diet. The other problem with meat is that it also creates a bacteria in the gut called TMAO, trimethylamine and oxidase. This bacteria travels and is one of the main ones, a lot of doctors test for it, Cardi cardiologists are testing now for this bacteria because that particular bacteria, absolutely, it's an independent biomarker, absolutely causes problems in the artery wall. Okay, it damages the wall, it weakens the wall. That bacteria comes from eating a lot of meat. Okay, so... Um, that I, I would have to say, that's the science on it. I know the paleo diet is popular because, so when a lot of people look at diet, okay, they're going to look at something, say, well, protein, you know, meat's got um, iron, it's got B12. It's, and I'm not going to argue with that. I say, yeah, it sure does. But you can get that from other sources, okay? So I, where I can agree on that there's nutritional value You've got to look at the other side of the equation as well, because there can be things that aren't as, as advantageous with the meat. So you got to weigh it out. Is getting the iron and B12 from the meat uh, better for you than possibly being at risk for the saturated fat 
and the TMAO, you know, the bacteria in the gut. How long does it take to reverse calcification? Is there a point in the calcification where complete reversal is not possible? So I don't really know the answer to that question. I can probably find out. Um, I noticed that for me with patients, it's kind of, I don't really have a, I, I think it's all over the map because some of my patients have different genetics. Some of them are way more diligent on their diet than others. Um, how long does it take? It's, it, I know that within a year I can see a difference, but I can't give you a value to know how much. I just know that it starts to reverse it. Um, and is there a point in the calcification where complete reversal is not possible? I don't know that. I think a lot of it's going to depend on your age. So if I have someone coming to me and they're 80 or 70, I may not have enough time to get total reversal. Somebody comes to me that's in their 40s or maybe 50s, and they ate really bad before, so they got some calcification. They're probably going to have time to make a bigger difference. So by the time they get into their 70s or 80s, they're going to be in much better shape than somebody in their 70s or 80s and, and trying to get reversal. Um, can you use powdered greens? Um, so you know, I don't... I don't know. I, I'd have to look and see how much is in the powder green. So it's like people always ask me questions and I'm like, all right, about supplements. And I don't know. They have to tell me how much green is in that supplement. So if they're taking a powdered green and I guess they're dehydrating it and they're taking all the water out of it is how much is, do they have a cup? They don't tell me this, but do they have a, cup of kale in there or is it just is it a fourth of a cup and i mean my feeling is you might have maybe a fourth of a cup um maybe i don't know i don't know i don't know how much i'd have to know you'd have to give me more information a lot of these powdered supplements don't give me the amounts of anything like they'll say proprietary blend, beetroot or greens and i'm like okay how much you don't, you don't tell me anything just because it has it in it like i said numbers count people numbers count we gotta look at that right so you bring up a great point about the importance of getting your labs done because disease such as diabetes and heart disease are years and decades in the making and we don't feel the damage we are doing to our bodies that is correct um and and so basically, it isn't until we're doing the and it, okay, hold on a minute. I kind of messed up because it got lost. Okay, there we go. It isn't until one day when we get the diagnosis that we realize we need to change the way we eat. Getting regular labs can help us recognize these health conditions that are forming in us before it's too late. Great point from Karen. So Karen's our food coach. She's studying to be an RD. Yeah, great point. She sees also a lot of my patients. She gets them to help them do their balancing. So she understands what's going on in some of their labs. And that's the problem with medicine is they wait until you get the disease because they're going to treat you for the pharma, pharma uh, drugs, pharmacological agents, whatever it's, Ozempa. You don't need to do anything on diet, just take Ozempa. Ozempa affects the brain chemicals. Ozempa is what's blocking dopamine. I can't help think that you're messing up there with the mood stability. Can't help think that it isn't going to have some kind of effect on depression when you get off of it. Just saying. Don't know yet. We don't have a lot of results on that, but that's just my feeling. You start messing with the brain chemicals and you're messing around, but it does reduce your appetite. And that's why they do it is because they end up eating less and they're losing weight on it. A lot of great comments, guys. Let me make sure. Um, so yeah, with the powdered greens, Beverly, if you can give me a little more information, if you can take a picture of your greens and let me see if, if they have any amounts of them on there, that would be awesome. Even if they say milligrams, give me something and then I can go look it up and try to compare what that is 
in relation to actually a real food. But I don't see how it would hurt you, right? I don't see how it would be something that wouldn't be good. Maybe your pocketbook. Um, Because sometimes those things can be expensive. Anyways, if anybody wants to unmute the mic, any comments? Um, um, we're not going to comment about um, arugula on that list. I didn't know. I noticed it wasn't on the list. And I always oh. thought that was very high in uh, vitamin K. Huge. It's huge. It's right up there with the collar. Most of your greens are going to be like the leafy greens, the deep ones are going to be definitely three, four, or 500. So, yeah, a cup of arugula. Arugula is one of the higher ones. I don't know why. I just forgot to put it in there, to be honest with you. I should have. No yeah, definitely. And yeah, if you look at some of these other, like iceberg lettuce is only 14. So, if you look at some of the other foods on the other side, you can see that there's not really a lot of vitamin K in any of these other foods here. Right. Yeah. And I, I just noticed, uh, so I looked at the, uh, I take a multivitamin. I noticed it's 2000 uh, I use of vitamin D. So is it wise to take a, a supplement for vitamin D? You know, I think 2000 is, is you got to go get tested. It may okay. be fine. You do a lot of walking, so you're outside a lot, so you may be fine. Okay. That's why I tell people, go get tested. As you age, typically, you don't absorb it as well. So I find it's going to be anywhere from two to 4,000 for most people to bring you back up to the levels that you need to be to maintain. Okay. Great questions. Any other questions? If anybody wants to unmute the mic. Myrna, you, you pretty much described my life tonight, talking about TMAO, homocysteine, everything. But I think Dr. Matthijs sent you my results. And um, it was unbelievable what your diet has done for me. It's just unbelievable. And I just want to say thank you. So. Well, I really appreciate that. Because, you know, Arnie, um, Arnie's a very active guy, lean. He's a lean machine. So... You would look at Arnie and you think there's no way this guy has heart disease of any kind. Okay. And Arnie had heart disease and he was eating healthy according to anybody else, but he was on this train wreck. A lot of these LDL fats and Arnie, it was within less than a year. You started to see the change. Right. I've only been on your program for less than a year and Dr. Matthias referred me to you, and he got me really straightened out, got the inflammation. They monitored it on the blood test. He started doing all the vitamins. That's what I'm saying tonight, hit home. He was getting my vitamin Ks, my, you know, the methylated Bs, everything in order. And we just chipping away and chipping away, and we got my inflammation down. But we could never quite get um, the – he told me, he said, you're going to be a diabetic in five years. And then wow. he kept – I needed to go see you. And I was kind of doing one thing at a time and I was getting his vitamins going. And then he put me on medicine, statins and all that. And I was like, ah, okay, I'll finally, and I finally got around to calling you. And then when you switched my diet, I really thought you and Dr. Matthias were on crack cocaine. I did. I'm going to be honest. I thought y'all are crazy because when y'all were telling me that caused insulin resistance, I said, I almost quit y'all. I'm like, they're wrong. And it made such a difference in my diet. It was the first time, and, and I've been going to him, and he tweaked everything and got me going perfect. But then I could never get my TMAO and my insulin resistance done. And in about four months on your diet, my insulin resistance, I want to say, it went from like 170 to whatever those numbers are, but they're all in the green. They're perfect. And right. it was in three on your diet. So yeah. between his program of, of what he did for me and your diet, that – it is amazing how my, how fast that worked. And, yeah. But you showed me. I switched from my healthy diet. I was always eating meat and salads and and thought I was healthy. But when you showed me how much fat I was eating, you said it tonight. I was eating avocado. I was eating nuts. I'd put two tablespoons of olive oil on my salad and have a piece of meat. And the meat's fresh. You know, it'd be deer meat, elk meat, or lean beef that I raised. And I'm like, but when you showed me, I, got, I was getting no fiber in my diet and 100 grams of fat, 
And when I switched that around, it I, I just can't quit telling people about it. It is unbelievable. Inflammation has gone. My my insulin resistance has gone. Everything has gone, and I feel good. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and your energy has gone up enormously. Yeah, because okay. I eat carbs now. I got diabetes in my blood, you know, my right. history, other everybody. So I wasn't eating carbs because I didn't want to be a diabetic. And when right. I had my back, I walked in there with with a blood pressure of 120 over 80, perfect. They did an EKG. They said, you're not having a heart attack. And then I had 98% blockage. I almost died. But um, I'm telling you, I can't quit telling people. I, I, I refer to people to you daily. Well, I appreciate it. I really do. I I am very passionate about this. Um, I show up to this live stream if I only get one person. I mean, I do not worry, honestly, because I feel if I can save one life, you know, in my life, that would be amazing. And the other thing is they've got it wrong. I just hate to say that because it sounds so, but so many people challenge me and they like, oh, you know, you're going against the grain. You know what you're telling people? Everybody's doing this and that. And look at all these doctors and look at, but I am telling you, just like Arnie's saying, I'm getting patients. I treat patients. That's what I do. And I'm seeing, just like with Arnie, within months, it changes. Their labs change. And all these excess fats people are eating, I am telling you, it is bad news. It doesn't work out well. I have many stories. I have patients like Arnie. I had a guy, fireman, great shape, surfer. This guy was amazing, 62 years old. He's also a patient of Dr. Matisse's. And he changed, he had a heart attack 10 years prior and he changed his life and he became a vegetarian and he did no meat. He was only eating nuts and avocados and fruits. I mean, he told me, he goes, I changed my entire diet, but he did not do the balance. He did not do the macronutrients. 10 years later, he has 99% blockage and almost died. And this is a guy that has a six pack. I mean, if you looked at him, you'd be like, that guy's like 69, 67, 68. He is amazing. But it's because he changed his diet. He did the macronutrients. He's eating the way Arnie says. And he said the same thing as Arnie. He goes, there's no way. Man, when he started with me, he was giving me studies after studies. Well, look, this doctor's promoting this keto diet and looked at it. And when you do a keto diet, when you first do a keto diet, you're going to get positive results, guys. You're going to get positive results because the keto diet is going to drop some weight. Absolutely. You're going to get rid of some fat. But when you have ketones in the muscle, you can't make ceramides. That's something to think about. So all this excess fatty acids that are circulating and accumulating in muscle cells, as soon as you go on a keto diet, your body chemically can't make ceramides. Now, I'm not saying, well, that's a great thing about a keto diet. I mean, it is a benefit. So their labs will improve right away, but they can't sustain it. And it's still excess fatty acids. And you're going to need a cheat day. You're going to need a cheat day on a keto diet. It's going to be inevitable. Why is that? It's not balanced. Muscles are going to spank you upside the head. Arnie, when you were doing your diet, you had to have a cheat day, right? Wouldn't you go to where you'd get so tired because your muscles couldn't sustain all the activity you do on meat and salad and avocados and olive oil, healthy foods and excess. But talk to me a little bit about the energy level that you didn't have eating that way. And also, did you have situations where you would find you would just have to really have self-control when it came to eating carbs or, or anything that had carbs in it? Oh, yeah. I'd have cravings and I was thirsty all the time. And like when we're working cattle, it's super hot in the cow pens. And I was trying to make up for it by drinking electrolytes. And I really studied on them. And I was drinking noon, had zero sugar in it, don't want diabetes. So I just drank that much more water. And when Dr. Matthijs first met me, he said, you look dry. And you said this in one of your seminars, when you have pre-diabetes and insulin resistance, you will be thirsty all the time. Right. And then you my diet up. And then you even told me your body needs those carbs. Well, I started eating 
you know, like a mango or dates, like you said, every hour when I was out there working and I was hot. And, and I, I mean, it was a mind shift. I'm thinking I'm going to have diabetes. I'm going to have something, you know, it runs in my body. I'm going I'm, I'm to get fat. And I didn't. I just had the energy level. I felt better the whole time. And I always try to do a natural one. I've always, I don't like a lot of packaged food. So I ate dates or a mango or an orange or an apple. And that was just why I was sweating. And then went to the balance, like you said, on all my meals. And I'm not thirsty all the time anymore. I'm not tired. My energy level is a lot better. But then the best results after two solid years, this is the first time my insulin resistance has gone down. And I wish I listened to Dr. Matosh and called you two years earlier. Oh. I mean, I, I just got those results a couple of weeks ago, and I hope he sent them to you. But yeah, it, was, it was unbelievable. It really yeah, was. it is unbelievable. And the thing is, you reverse aging. That's the that's the other thing. And so why Arnie was talking about carbs is because for those that haven't been to some of my live streams, is that carbohydrates, just the word carbohydrates, let me write that for you guys, um, is means carbs mean fuel, hydrate means water. And when carbohydrates get in the muscle, they bind with water. That's why they're called carbohydrates. When you have insulin resistance, when you're eating a lot of these excess fatty acids, they accumulate in the receptor site that insulin it sits on those muscle cells. It doesn't allow sugar in the muscle. When sugar doesn't get in the muscle, when those carbs don't get in the muscle, you lose water. Drink all the water you want. Arnie was doing electrolytes. He's drinking water. And he wasn't getting the, the muscle. He wasn't hydrating at a cellular level. Because you have to do a balanced diet to reverse insulin resistance so that you can hydrate your body. So this is the whole balance thing. This is the whole science behind eating is understanding. And I will tell you that um, th thank you, um, Julie. She said tonight's podcast was amazing. And thanks, Arnie, for sharing your story. Yeah, it really does help when 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 you unmute the mic and you have something to share like that. It's so um, inspiring for others because they want to hear success. People love to hear success. And so, Arnie, thank you because you probably saved someone's life because maybe they were thinking of doing this or maybe they weren't. But when you have somebody like you say, hey, this has worked, it's changed my life, means everything. Well, thank you. And I, and I want to add one more thing. You remember, I kind of switched off of red meat when I first had my heart attack, and I went to more of a Mediterranean with too much olive oil. And I was eating a lot of salmon or sardines and fish and you know, thought that was healthier for me. My TMAO skyrocketed. You remember it, it tripled. Oh, yeah. Right. What's going on? And that's when I first started meat. You said, you got too much fat. And I'm like, it's good fat. And you're like, it's still too much fat. You're eating 100 grams plus. And I was. I added it up on 50. And then when I got that Mediterranean diet out of the way and went to balance like you're doing, and the biggest trouble wasn't cutting back the fat. I thought, oh, my God, this fat's going to be hard to live without. I love fatty foods. But that wasn't that hard. It was getting 35 grams of fiber in my body a day. But once right. I got DMAO, which causes lesions on your artery, which causes a heart attack, so that was huge to me. But when you showed me that, it that was huge. And a lot of people blame red meat, but it's just too much fat in your body. It doesn't matter if it's coming from salmon or a steak or from olive oil, it's going to cause a problem. Right, right on. People don't realize that. This is the biggest message I'm trying to share with the world, is that it's about balance and it's about understanding these macronutrients make a difference. Numbers make a difference. If numbers make a difference in your bank account, no, numbers make a difference in your body, okay? And this TMAO, this gut bacteria, it's the new frontier in medicine. And these bacteria travel to other parts of our body. They affect with rheumatoid arthritis. We're seeing it with thyroid issues. We're seeing it with cardiovascular disease. So these bacteria are all made in the gut, so much in the gut. And also I want to share with you guys, excess fats that you're eating cause more bad gut bacteria, just excess fats in general. These fats are called lipopolysaccharides. They grow in number and size. So when you're eating a diet that's high in fat, these fats in your gut 
protect the bad bacteria. They form uh, an armor. So high-fat diets actually increase gut bacteria. And back to a comment I had in the chat about all these people doing these paleo diets, um, you know, that's a problem because they're very high in fat. And Ari, Ari talked about when, when, Ari, when we looked at his diet, he was, you know, he needed to be down around 25%. He was up around maybe 40%. It wasn't like he was eating enormous amount of fats, okay? Because he just said, I was doing some olive oils or he was eating more than the percentage that you need. And that's the key I want to say here, eating more than you need, period. And some people eating more than they need can be more of a disaster than other people because not all of us have the same genotype. So thank you, Arnie. Um, anybody else want to share? Anybody else want to um, ask a question, comment on Arnie? Oh, I have a question for you, Arnie. This is McKenna. Um, from a dietitian standpoint, you kind of mentioned that you thought that um, Myrna was crazy and the cardiovascular physician was crazy. I get that a lot. And I'll be sitting next to my men and mostly my men who are either cattle ranchers or they're keto guys and their kidneys are failing on these diets. And I can't always get through to them on what they're doing they come in, they're going to tell me what they want, what they're going to do. What was the turning point for you? What made you follow through? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm a slow person. I got to do things for one step at a time, but almost dying. When they told me I had a 98% blockage, you know, and I, I would have been dead in 24 hours. That was it. Sadly, it takes that. And so I'm trying to preach it to everybody, but, um, and I've got friends just like you're saying, I'm in the cattle business. I'm, I've been in the cattle business forever and, and very high up in the cattle business. And, and then people just don't want to hear it. Uh, they're just like, Oh no, it's not. But it, the, the biggest thing too, is if, if they would realize that balance that Myrna's saying and, and getting that, those four, the, you know, the carbs, the fiber, the fat all in check, the, I, I don't know how to convince them. I, I really don't, but, I've got so many friends that I'm telling that and I just refer them to Myrna and I'm like, you got to listen to her and you got to get this in balance. And, and the biggest thing is everybody thinks, especially insulin resistance, which I don't know if that's number, they keep changing it. You know, gut health's really high on causing a heart attack, insulin resistance are number one, number two. And so I try to tell them that story to get them to change, you know, it, insulin resistance and diabetes, your kidneys failing. You, you got to start listening and, and I just kind of make it simple to them. I said, look, you really have to increase your fiber and, right. and it hurt to have carbs if you've got the fiber in it. And I try to put it in that simple method to them and they'll start listening when I leave, when I put it in that simple term. Yeah. I mean, I, McKenna, you, you're in a hospital situation. So are people coming to you? Are they in, are, you know, are so they in the, bad shape? The, the situation that I'm, I'm particularly thinking of is I do cardiovascular group classes and it's, and you know, it's, it's what I'm supposed to do, but you do the basics and, you know, I'm standing usually in front of eight or 10 men that are cattle ranchers and they all kind of, you know, they get that group mentality where, you know, you're standing up there just giving them the basics and they're fighting you every which way and it's just <laughs> and you know the nurses they're all in the back kind of agreeing and i go over like the correct fat concentrations and stuff like that and it's a group so you're not going to go in too much depth but you know they just had a heart attack they did just this is a cardiovascular center for rehab and and they they have hit rock bottom in some instances and but they're I, I I'll get I'll even get classes where I'll get one or two people that are like, oh, no, my you know, I changed my whole diet. I'm doing this, that and the other. And they'll tell them firsthand, you know, my lab works beautiful. And and then I'll get that one person who's like, you know, I rather die than give up X, Y and Z foods. And you're like, well, that's your that's that is what's happening. <laughs> it is, but, but to your point, I almost didn't want to go to Myrna and then she was going to have Karen sit there and talk to me. And I really thought they were going to put me on a vegetarian diet. And then we can't kind of go back on our lifestyle and say, Hey, we've been doing it wrong all life. It, it's like admitting your whole career and raising beef is wrong. But Myrna said something very significant to me too. You can only digest 
what is it, Myrna, 20 grams of protein, maybe 30 at a time? Right. That's a steak. And so if I eat a four-ounce sirloin with beans and balance it out and some good healthy carb, a baked potato instead of French fries or a half a baked potato with a skin, I'm still eating just like I did, or I eat deer meat or my elk meat or the fish I catch, but I balance it. And, and right. it's, I got to have beans in most of my diet now. And, um, but that's not a, a cattleman can live with four ounces of steak and not a 16. When we go to a cattleman's dinner, they lay a ribeye on your plate that covers the whole plate. And then you got to go get another plate for your French fries and your salad. And we all think, Oh, that salad's healthy. Myrna blew me away when she showed me that my salads weren't giving me what two grams of fiber. Yeah. <laughs> I ate two grams of fiber and a hundred grams of fat. And so if a cattleman can't figure that out, we just got to dial it back to a four ounce. I mean, beef is so efficient of a protein. It only takes four ounces. Right. And that's, I'm glad you mentioned that Arnie, because in my program, I don't eliminate food. I really don't. I tell people we have to get the right percent. You did. Karen didn't either. When Karen started putting my diet, she said, you like sirloin? Cause she saw it on one of my diets and she put together a four ounce and balanced it out for me. And, I, I really appreciate you all for that. But how we get through to the cattlemen, we we they all think you gotta eat a sixteen ounce ribeye and a and some French fries. And that's it, meat and potato. That's so let me let me just make sure I heard you right. So you're so if you only absorb twenty to thirty grams of protein in a sitting, you'll do that. You'll start with eating the beans and then you'll do four ounce sirloin and then you're hoping like you're getting most of the the digestion from the bean interesting. Okay. So what that means, McKenna, is that um, it's based on how much protein you can absorb is kind of based on your body size, okay? Hi. So on average, your body's constantly going through the protein. So let's say, Arnie, how much do you weigh? Um, You want me to lie about my weight? No, <laughs> about a buck 65. Okay, buck 65. So if you take, I'll just round it up to 170. So that means Arnie needs um, about 85 grams of protein. Okay. So, you know, 85, maybe 90 grams, we'll put it. So that means that as he goes through his day, okay, he's constantly going through protein. So after about four hours, it goes from, from let's say, 85 grams down to 65. And then it goes 65 down to, down to maybe 55. So... The difference of 55 to 85 is only 20 grams. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so as you go through your day, that, that, that starts to drop. So you're never going to be able to, you, you can't put more protein. The, you give the body more protein than it needs. It just discards it. It's like a glass of water. You fill it to the top and it's like, you can keep eating it, but it's not going to do anything for you. So basically what happens is, you have a big guy that needs, let's say, you know, he weighs 200 pounds. He needs 100 grams of protein. Well, then, yeah, he'll drop from 100 down to 40. So he might be able to absor absorb more than Arnie because he's a bigger guy. Mm -hmm. So when you start getting de protein depleted down to like, for somebody like Arnie, you get down to the 30 gram mark, you know, like you go 16 hours without protein, mm -hmm. especially if he's active, right? His metabolism's going quicker. Then at that point, we know Arnie's going to probably start dipping into his own reserve. He's going to start eating his own muscle. He's going to get muscle atrophy. So he might take it from 30 grams up to 50. Mm -hmm. But he's still, when he goes to eat, he's only still going to absorb 30 to 35 at the max. You know what I mean? Okay. So, so, so it's all based on your size. But as a rule of thumb, yeah, most people... I mean, in Arnie's case, it's maybe 25 grams. He'll probably, you know, 25 to 30. So, yeah, I'd say most people probably can't absorb more than 40 grams at one time. Um, because if their body dips that low, they're they're eating themselves. So I don't know if that makes sense. What I, I just... I kind of get it. Um, I, I totally know like how to calculate the the total for the day and I kind of get the hours and how it depletes. Right. I think it's the, I think what I'm thinking is with the red meat and the TMAO generation, but if you're balancing a, a plate where you're getting, you know, you're hitting that gut health chart and you're maximizing glutathione, that's going to reduce the TMAO. So if you're doing four ounces and you're still monitoring the fat intake, you're kind of covering your bases. Sort of. 
Okay. And I'll tell you, I'll tell you why. Because I've so the thing with TMAO is that I've seen people get TMAO. I've seen pe- I've seen two people eat the same diet, and one has TMAO and one doesn't. Oh, it's a genotype. So the thing with the TMAO, you always ha- you have TMAO in your gut anyway. So if you're eating, a, you know, Arnie's got TMAO because he's he's he is eating a little bit of animal, but it's at a very low level. Okay. So when when these bacteria are at low level, it's not a problem because your good guys will kill them. They're, they're not going to get circulating because they're not going to leave the gut. You know, you're just not going to see them in the vascular system because they're they're not overloaded. So with TMAO, it's definitely made from cheese, meat. You know, even fish has got TMAO. Chicken's got TMAO. Anything from an animal flesh is going to have high TMAO. Anything from an animal. So if you're eating a lot of fat, a lot of avocados, a lot of nuts, and then you're only eating four ounces of TM, four ounces of animal, I've seen TMAO. Okay, so I have seen a correlation with a high fat diet and animal. So maybe not even a high fat diet from animal, but just a high fat diet in general and animal seen TMAO. I have seen a animal and a low fat diet and no TMAO. So, so for me, I've kind of seen it around different matters about the total, not the source. It, the source, it just kind of, I can tell you that patients that are doing like Ernie, three to four ounces of animal, and they're really just keeping it lower and they're not doing fat. I don't see any TMAO. Got it. I got it. Okay. I can, I can spin this. Thank you. That's Yeah. Yeah. And I will tell you. Uh, vegans have no TMAO at all. And even when you see them eat with a higher fat diet. So if I have a vegan that's doing a lot of nut and avocados and all, they could have diabetes. Vegans have diabetes because they're just doing excess fat. But I will tell you, I never see TMAO in a, in a vegan. Uh I, I have a plan going in. Arnie, thank you so much. I think I might be able to help a lot of, get through to a lot more people. So thank you. I appreciate that. Awesome. And also, McKenna, um, you know, email me at any time because I think last week I was going to yeah. give you something I forgot. Just I get busy. Yeah. Just email me. But also we can make this YouTube video available. So also so I'm, I've, I hired somebody that's going to help me try to get these up quicker. And that might help you. Right. If you could give this to one of your patients, if they'd watch it, it might, yep. they, they would hear Arnie and that yep. would, that could be huge. Mm-hmm. Yes, it would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you guys. Thank you, Myrna. As awesome. Well. Yeah. So any other questions? Um, I know that uh, some of this is new material for you guys. Some of you guys, um, I've probably already explained this to you on your um, nutrition packet. If it relates to you, let me know if you got it, if it works. If you're like, I got it now, because it is it is kind of hard to understand all this stuff with this heart disease and how food and all this stuff relates. So I don't see anything else in the chat. Um, anybody else want to share? Unmute your mic. Feel free. All right. I will see you guys next week. On Tuesdays, I always stick with the lean life. And on Wednesdays, I try to pick something that will be impactful in your life and nutrition. Hope this helped. Leave me any comments. Let me know. And I certainly appreciate you. Thank you very much. I'll see you guys next week.